Welcome once again to Arctic Fire. This unique gathering of swordsmiths explores the outer edge of the craft, where craftsmanship, artistry, storytelling, history, and myth combine. This year, the group has recreated objects found in the legendary horde of Grendel, from the most ancient surviving poem in Old English, Beowulf. Four days of live broadcast in which legends will be reborn. Arctic Fire 2016, Grendel's Horde. Attention, people of Earth. This is your new lord and master speaking. Mars needs whiskey. Um, hi, Jareth Alus here. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, gilding in uh, what limited capacity I may. Um, we, we know that a lot of the objects are gilded. This can mean a lot of things in general. It means there's gold on it. Um, gold was this really important thing in the ancient world because it represented wealth, especially, again, in this um, uh, militant mead hall culture. Um, one of the most important things for a uh, king to be able to do is give away gold quite freely and have glittering gold presents like all about. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways that uh, we can do that. We can make all of these objects in solid gold, which does happen. Um, but as practically speaking, uh, difficult even in historical times. Um, so there's, there's a lot of solutions for how we get gold onto other objects. So we can have something that looks like gold, um, but doesn't necessarily have to have the expense uh, or the weight. Gold is also very, very heavy. Um, um, so yeah, there we go. Just a little rambly today. That's just what I'm going to do. So um, let's go to the next picture, please, Van. Okay, so a uh, typical object that has gilding on it. Uh, these are the taplo horns from a particularly rich burial that dates to around the period we've been talking about, uh, found in Taplow, England. And um, uh, these pieces are just, they're really nice. They kind of inspired uh, a lot of what, uh, what I did on the lyre. They look like uh, some of the imagery on the lyre for certain. Um, the press black that Pather did uh, with the dagged, uh, dagged shape and the, the arm that was found. Uh, that uh, also you can see is very reminiscent of the shapes up here. It's kind of a typical adornment um, on these. Uh, this, this, these ones in particular have a technique I'm, I'm really excited about because, uh, and I'll show a close up in a minute, not only do they have gilding on them, but they uh, also have niello um, mixed in with it. So you've got this gold color, this silver color, and this uh, niello black accent. So um, that's something I would really like to take this next level of uh, my skills to do. So let's click in. <clears throat> so you can see a little bit better here. Um, the, the little bits that go up here have these alternating kind of triangles that create a zigzag of silver. Uh, niello, for those that uh, haven't seen, uh, the previous Arctic fire where I demonstrated that. Niello is a fusion inlaid alloy that's black in color. Uh, it's actually a metal. It's uh, silver and lead uh, and copper sulfide uh, that melts at around 700 Fahrenheit. And you can flood it into uh, indentations of a surface and then uh, smooth that all off after it hardens. And you're left with this really striking positive uh, negative thing going on um, uh, in the eyeballs, I think. It's a nice touch right there. Uh, and the yellow pupils in the eyeballs. And uh, But I always used to wonder when I first saw this object, how did they do this in yellow, which is actually kind of a messy technique, and how did they get this gold mixed in with it? Um, and uh, there's a couple different ways I can think of to do that, but we know that an awful lot of pieces on this are gilded. Um, uh, you can see actually on the nose, uh, or even up on the rim of the cup, you can see where it comes back to silver. 
And that's evidence of this thin layer of gold wearing away over time. Oh, Master Jewel? Yes. Um, your beautiful earrings are hitting the microphone, causing loud clanking where you need to change your microphone. That's what I get for being fashionable. So, um, where were we before all that? I don't know. We were talking about the size of the horns here, these taplo horns. Are, uh, they're really big. Um, and that's because I think uh, it, it's really important for uh, nob nobility or a king to be able to show off wealth in this culture. And uh, what shows off wealth more than a giant horn? Uh, and also, uh, there, were, there were drinking rituals that involved passing the horn around and everyone would take a sip. And that was just a way of sharing a sacred space uh, there's an awful lot about uh, ritual drinking like that. So a big horn for a king would be this really uh, important symbolic object. And a big horn uh, with lots of bling on it would be an even more important uh, object. Um, but Auroch, the horn is Auroch. So Jake had asked, uh, asked me to talk about what the horn is, which is Auroch. Auroch were these very, very large uh, almost uh, steer-like, oxen-like uh, creatures in northern Europe. I think the last one died in the 1500s uh, when we were in Copenhagen in the museum. I actually took a picture of Dave standing next to a skeleton and I mean it, its head would be here. It was just as big as a horse if not bigger and the horns are just enormous. Um, so it's, this is a very large object which is kind of cool. So uh, we have this evidence of this thin layer of gold wearing away on this object, um, which is cool because it shows us what's underneath. Um, this is mostly gold over silver. Um, so again, uh, so this silver can later be exposed. Um, one of the theories I have is that you could make a whole object like this and then you could do the niello, you could gild, a thin layer of gold over the whole thing, uh, which can be a little bit of a messy process, depending, but you could come back in later and re-expose the silver. And then I think that's m most likely the main way a lot of this was done. It's also possible to inset something like this, particularly if it's pressed black, it would you know, be easy to sort of set these, but I don't, I don't see evidence without having done extensive research or, or you know, really look terribly closely. Um, I've never seen evidence that this isn't a continuous piece of metal. So I think that it's this interesting series of steps that arrives at this technique, which you see on a lot of objects, this particular combination. So I'm excited to uh, finally have equipment to be able to do something like that myself. Um, next. Uh, this is another really great example. Um, this is the finial on the horn. It comes up to a really great uh, eagle or raven. Um, got some nice little serpent guys coming up here and the same little sort of solid one uh, to two style. Um, more evidence of the gilding wearing away right here on the bead and in some other places. Um, and again, this is all, all silver. So even though it's gilded, uh, which one can see as a, um, a, a way of not being as ostentatious. Um, they certainly weren't cheaping out on the silver, which was actually still quite valuable back in the day, uh, because you can do these techniques over copper or bronze or other metals. So I think even though it's gilded, this is clearly a, a very, very uh, wealthy object and uh, one that I like quite a bit. So gilding uh, can mean a lot of different things. In general, it simply means there's gold on it. Uh, it's not usually called gilding with silver. More likely that can be called damascening, not to be and often confused with Damascus. Um, however, you can use the typical techniques uh, more associated with silver damascening with gold. Um, both in their pure states are super soft and like to do various kinds of inlays and overlays, which is, again, you know, one kind of form of gilding, um, which would be mechanical 
gilding. So there are ways to put gold on other metals um, uh, that we call mechanical because that means maybe you make some cross hatching with some underscoring and hammer a very thin soft sheet of gold onto a parent metal or maybe it's inset and set into a frame of some kind. Um, that would be mechanical in nature. Uh, another kind of gilding is leaf gilding. Um, leaf gilding is using very, very thin sheets of gold. Gold has this amazing uh, malleable quality. You can hammer it to thinner than a sheet of paper and it maintains its integrity. Um, gold leaf is really cool. You can almost see light through it. Um, uh, when you buy it, it comes in these these little sheets and a little, and a little like precious little paper thing that you unfold. And uh, the way that you actually pick it up is traditionally with a brush that you rub and get some static electricity on. And you pick it up very gently because if it starts to fold in onto itself, it will just crumble. And what can be really amazing is to take a you know, three by four sheet of this gold leaf and intentionally wad it up to see how much gold it really isn't. It's actually kind of a cool thing. Um, the way that typically gets applied is by the use of some kind of glue, uh, which is traditionally called sizing. Um, you paint it on and let it dry and it's super, super tacky. And you take that brush with this dangling piece of gold leaf and you gently lay it over and it just sticks. And then you come back in later and burnish it and it can be fairly indistinguishable. Uh, from a solid gold object. Um, you think of picture frames that are gold leafed. That's, that's usually how that's done. Um, so uh, after, uh, and we actually do see the evidence of this on some ancient objects. So I kind of think of it as a more modern technique, but in fact, um, it's, it's used from Roman times on and there are objects that show it. Uh, diffusion gilding is another way of gilding. Uh, diffusion gilding takes uh, advantage of this really cool quality of thin gold. It can be uh, thicker than gold leaf. It's usually called gold foil at this stage. And uh, most metals, if they are very, very clean and in particular well polished, um, it does not take much for them to fuse. If you uh, take this gold foil, and put it on a piece of uh, silver, particularly fine silver or with a fine silver surface. But even uh, very clean iron and steel, you can take gold foil, uh, heat the parent metal, the steel or the silver or other metals, up to oh, three or 400 Fahrenheit or so. I think with the steels, it's a little higher. Uh, if you look for the bluing, so it's probably five, maybe 600 degrees. And you can lay this gold foil down and again burnish it and it just sticks. It just fuses. The gold at that thickness, and this actually gets used for a lot of industrial applications, will let oxygen molecules through. And there's something about that creating a very non-oxidizing atmosphere in between the metals and it just sticks. Um, it's a Korean technique called kumbu that takes great advantage of that. It's actually very handy. Yes. Peter and I were having a discussion about exactly, wait a minute, we should investigate this as a more common uh, way of doing these things on sword hilts. And it uh, found some really great articles uh, from some academic publications that, that show, yes, this, this has been done. So are you, saying, are you saying that you can just fuse leaf to? Like it's foil, it's foil. thicker than leaf. Okay. You have to get it's yeah. thicker than leaf. But right. you can get it. Yeah, and it, it really does just yeah. stick. I've, I, I did it uh, in college. So that's a, that's a cool technique. There's a lot of different applications for that. Um, then we also have depletion gilding. Um, depletion gilding is very, very fun. Um, if you know what raising a fine silver surface is on sterling, it's kind of the same principle. You have an alloy. It can be as little as 15% gold, commonly higher, but it can be that low. And you uh, treat that material with an acid. Uh, that attacks the alloying element and leaves a very thin layer of gold, uh, which usually must be burnished down a little bit after the fact. Uh, Mayan or Aztec, uh, I know that a lot of the objects the conquistadors found, 
they were like, whoa, this thing is solid freaking gold, man. It's going to be awesome. And when they hacked into it, they saw this other metal. What's going on there? Uh, it was a, they call it tumbaga, this alloy. And um, the cool thing about it, though, is if it wears away, it's really easy to repair. You just put it back in the acid and burnish it again. So it, it's kind of self-replenishing in this very interesting way. That's something I would like to explore as far as raising big vessels and finding ways to um, have the appearance of gold. It still takes a lot of gold to do this, though, because you know, if you're making a chalice or something, 30% uh, of it being 24 karat gold is still a lot of gold, but it does have some nice potential. So um, that's not the way that most of the gilding in the Roman migration up through the Viking Age was done, however. Uh, the most common way uh, is, is called fire gilding. Um, fire gilding is very, very exciting, and we do have some technical accounts from history about fire gilding. Uh, both Theophilus, uh, writing in the 1100s, and Cellini in the 1500s, uh, describe doing this process. Um, I can't remember which one of them it is, but one of them recommends employing an itinerant worker mm -hmm. to do a lot of the process uh, stages because uh, you take mercury, uh, which we have some here, and you need to heat it up uh, in the presence of some very thin pieces of gold and stir it about and then uh, compress it into a paste which you smear onto your object and then heat again. So it makes a lot of mercury fumes. So uh, as a safety precaution, we're all going to hold our breath. Okay. Right. No, no. <laughs> I really wanted to ham that part up. I was going to have props and do the whole nine yards. Um, we're not going to fire gilding because you have to burn mercury to do that. I did some in college uh, with all the safety precautions. I had a full mercury respirator, which is a really big affair. I did it outside uh, with the wind at my back, as they say. And uh, I didn't actually heat it with a torch to drive off the fumes. I used a 100 watt light bulb, and it was a very, very, very small piece. Um, so it works. And it's neat. Um, I'll describe it a little bit more because it is what got used here. So um, you take uh, very, very small pieces of gold sheet, foil, or little clippings, uh, filings, uh, and they would get mixed in with mercury. Um, that gets heated up gently, and there's a certain point at which the gold will actually just dissolve into the mercury. It's called an amalgam at that point of metals. Um, that gets uh, consolidated a little bit so that it becomes more like a paste. That's the first uh, application of heat to the mercury. Uh, then you have this paste, which you can literally just scoop onto the piece. That's uh, quite tacky. And uh, then you heat it again. And the mercury drives off uh, in fumes, leaving the gold behind. Um, and uh, depending on how good of a job you did or what kind of chemical aftertreatments, uh, you, you may need to burnish it down. Um, but it leaves a nice thick uh, application. Uh, one of the nice things about it is that it does seem to, looking at the objects we have from history, be uh, a bit more durable in terms of uh, gold treatments. Um, so that's, that's fire gilding, very exciting stuff. Okay. But what I'm going to do today is not fire gilding. Uh, I'm just going to be doing electroplating. Um, electroplating is another method of gilding uh, where we have a liquid uh, that has a gold suspension in it. Uh, amazingly enough, if you want to look at that, um, it's clear, which is kind of cool because it really does just start turning stuff into gold. Um, while you're here, actually, it would be a good opportunity to show you these. So um, the color difference on the bronze uh, was very hard to read. I don't know if the camera is going to pick that up in here. Um, if you get it out in the sun, it's a really striking difference. 
And it really does make that piece all of a sudden seem like it's just this much more um, lavish thing. It's very exciting because um, I was like, I never make anything out of that much gold right now. Especially, it has the appearance of 24 karat too, so it's, it's a very rich color. Um, I did have a chance to take one of Pato's um, press black and apply uh, the electroplating to it. And the really nice thing about that is that um, because I, I just did, there, there's chemical cleaning that you would normally do before you do this, I didn't have access to all of that. Um, it left this really nice antiqued effect on that. I mean, if you compare uh, if you compare that to the dags on the horn, um, you can see we've got a little bit more reflection going on, but we still have this like nice antiqued effect that I'm really happy about. For a color comparison, uh, we've got that. Um, you know, that's what the original looks like. So that's a really great transformation. Um, I, so I now feel like I can maybe start to make some of these great objects from legend with all the gold. Very exciting. So um, the electroplating works by taking that solution, which has the gold suspended in it, passing an electric current on it onto the object that we would like to be covered in gold. And um, it really just does it. It's really kind of crazy. And uh, it's like magic. Um, if you've ever, if you do any jewelry work and you have a pickle pot, uh, you would know that it's the same thing basically as sticking iron in your pickle. If you have a silver object in a, a well-used pickle solution, which now has copper suspended in it, and you put iron in there, it will become a plating solution and cover all of your um, hard work that you did in college, soldering stuff together for the first time with with copper, because some jerk put the iron tweezers in there. Yeah, it's like this really obnoxious problem in public studios that happens all the time. Okay. Um, I have this in the pickle because it should be as chemically clean as possible. Um, and it's not 100% ideal, uh, but it should do the job. I have another of Petter's pressed black here. Let's see what it's in here. Uh, this is distilled water, albeit with um, tasty, tasty electrolytes in it, <laughs> which I think actually caused a, caused a little bit of fuzziness here. But what you want is, uh, is distilled water, pure distilled water, um, because again, we want things to be as chemically clean as possible. Um, so I'm going to rinse that, and let's see, I can hold that edge. Set things down on a nice little blue guy. <coughs> um, press that clean. So um, y you'll notice one thing I'm not doing today, and that's having a nice glass of tasty cider, because uh, these chemicals can be pretty nasty. Um, up until fairly recently, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 years ago, the vast majority of gold plating solutions had cyanide in them. So um, uh, especially in the studio, uh, working with the cyanide plating uh, solutions, uh, almond liqueurs are right out. You don't want to uh, confuse any of your flavor notes. Um, sure, yeah. Glenn Clayton says, do we have any truth to the ancient batteries in that electroplating? Um, that actually, uh, in Mayan culture, there is evidence for that, or Aztec, I can't remember which, but in, in Central America, they definitely had batteries that looked like they were being used for electroplating. They were all about big gold crazy objects, that's why they also came up with the depletion gilding. What, I, what, how do, what do you mean batteries? Like how did they make them? Uh, like clay pots with uh, like lead in them and okay. acid, just like a just like a car battery or a motorcycle battery. That's so cool. Yeah, they really did. Pretty neat. Yeah, and it took a while for I guess they found these objects, and there was some controversy about whether or not they could have been batteries. And then when they finally decided they were really batteries, they're like, well, why would they need batteries? And then someone was like, gold plating, dude. Okay, so. Um, <coughs> 
there's some, there's some odd chemistry that goes on with this stuff. The gold plating solution is pretty favorable to uh, sterling, I'm sorry, pure silver, fine silver. It's not as favorable to uh, copper or bronze. So before you do the gold plating, um, you have to do a nickel plating. And the nickel plating uh, is fine on uh, most of those metals. And then the gold plating is perfectly happy with the nickel plating. So, um, so that's what I'm going to be doing first. There's a little bit of the uh, nickel plating. I am going to wear uh, splash glasses because, um, you know, this, this isn't cyanide, but I'm sure I don't want it in my eyes. Um, I'm also reasonably certain I don't want it on my skin if I'm going to do this a lot. So I'm actually going to put the gloves on. In fact, um, the fumes aren't particularly great either. I do have some of the cyanide gold plating solution at home, and uh, I was using it once, and for a little bit, I don't know if I was insecurely being paranoid or not, but I felt a little, uh, a little awkward uh, as a safety precaution. Um, Peter, would you, would you mind sharing that story? Uh, yeah. <coughs> I did my uh, this blacksmith training. Uh, we did a course with the silversmith department uh, with gilding. It was great <coughs> to forge uh, a, a big, great object in iron and gild it and get that great, rich gold. And I made a, a chalice <coughs> um, big enough for half a liter or something like that and uh, applied many layers of, of electrolytic gold. So, so it was this really, really buttery, nice, almost like fire gilded look oil. And I religiously carefully washed it because the solution was one of those with some cyanide in it. So I didn't want to be anywhere in a risk. However, um, the, the introduction of use of this was with a very nice um, uh, Belgian beer. So, so um, one of these rich flavorful beers. And I was sitting um, reading and enjoying this beer and thought it was a bit strange that it tasted marsipan. And um, I kept reading and, and sipping this beer and found myself with a slight heaviness over the chest and sort of difficulty focusing on the text. And I poured out the beer, feeling a little bit silly, but found four straight layers right through the gold into the iron where the gilding had been eaten away by some kind of mm. Process right at the surface of the beer, and possibly releasing some of the solution trapped mm. between the gold and the iron. Very, very little, but enough to give that strong beer a definite taste of bitter almond. Mm. Mm. And I, so I sat, sat there for a little while, wondering what to do next. And it was an interesting experience to, to notice how it slowly <coughs> wore away this effect. Mm. And uh, I don't know how much was. Um, just imagining, but the taste came first and the effect after. Maybe just right. so sugar pills, yeah. but it, I don't know. <laughs> it was, I drank some marzipan tasting beer anyway. I yeah. wouldn't recommend it. So, yes, so be careful, especially with the uh, cyanide solution. And this, I should say, I did not use nickel before. And I think, oh, I, I think, think that's, that's one an issue. of the yes. critical yeah, things. We do actually think that's an issue because gold plated stuff does get used for silverware. So, yes, it's, it it's not that it's always unsafe, but. You want to double check what you're doing. So I have this nickel solution. It's green. It's very exciting. And uh, I have uh, a handy dandy uh, plating. It's called a pen plater. Um, and it's, it's really nice for little things. It's not as big a, a, of an investment as getting like the tanks that you would more typically do this kind of stuff in. You can use less solution, so it's less expensive. Um, this bottle of the gold plating solution is, uh, you know, it's. I don't know what the, the volume is, one ounce. Um, it has uh, a penny weight and a half of gold in it, which I think is like maybe three grams. So like three paper clips worth of gold suspended in there. Uh, so it's like $80. It's pretty expensive. You don't want to waste it. You want to be careful, which means you also have to be really careful about not mixing these things together. Um, you can ruin a whole bottle of the solution. So it comes with this nice little beaker. You can pour out just what you want to use as you're going to use it. Um, this has a, a nice little pen. 
that has this kind of little felty insert tip that uh, you are somewhat, somewhat replaceable. So um, that's nice. I have actually done this before with uh, an old motorcycle battery, some crosslock tweezers, uh, and a bit of uh, cotton around the end of one of them. Um, and it did totally work. Uh, I did some experiments before we came out here because I thought it would be really fun to show, show me doing it that way. I think, I think that only worked because the motorcycle battery was really, really old and it wasn't putting out a full 12 volts. So. You should make one of these Mayan batteries. Right. Oh, that would be really great. Yeah. So anyway, what I have, this, is, this operates on regular power. It, it puts out 1 to 8 amps. Uh, that's uh, important depending on the size of what you're working with. Um, this is the negative lead. It has to be clamped onto the piece to help connect the circuit. You can just clamp that anywhere. Um, right, I don't have the camera there, so I can sort of do this. We're not gonna see a lot of activity at first when I'm doing this. Um, you just wanna kinda roll it on there and then leave the pen in place. Now, I don't know how close you can get, but if you can see that there's little bubbles forming, that means it's plating and it's also turning darker. You can see that. So I'm just going to keep going around. Um, and they say you don't want to let this dry in place or it can create some streaking. That happened to me earlier and it didn't seem to cause any great problems. Yeah. Yeah, I'm nickel plating, whoever's. Yeah. Um, what I found is it can be it can be helpful to just sort of let it hover in one spot because the current is passing between the pen and the object. There's a little bit of it uh, causing the solution sitting on the rest of the object to uh, come out of suspension, but mostly you just want to move gently, slowly with this. Does it make a big difference to the level of polish of the, the object? It does. Yeah, that's the other reason why uh, the press black has this other surface to it, although I did um, lightly burnish it uh, with one of these um, paper towels, these blue paper towels here, they're like a little more exciting than your average paper towel, if a paper towel can be exciting. They are, they are, exciting. They are they're nice, they're, and they have this, this rough sort of surface to them, and I thought, oh, I wonder what this will do, and it actually brightened it up quite a bit. But if you have a very highly polished surface, when you put the gold on it, it will look even more highly polished. When I did the two pieces, well, the one piece over there, um, I was really surprised how much more of the polish came out on that, on the bronze after, after I electroplated. So, yeah. This, this is a part right. I need a, a story time with J. Arthur Luce. <laughs> I posted that video of me casting and telling that story, and I, I had old college friends that were like, I can't believe you told that story again. <laughs> and I can't believe I listened again. <laughs> Justin Mercy says, oh God, the frog story. Uh, seven amps right now. It's adjustable. I'm gonna say to work lower. I guess I should. Have. Sorry that. But, um, you can if it's too high. And this happened when I did the experiment with uh, a new motorcycle battery. If it's too high, uh, it will actually just kind of um, <laughs> burn and cook. <laughs> John Storm says, "What's the frog story?" <laughs> uh -huh. I'll tell you later, John. <laughs> <laughs> the internet will never forgive me for transgressing a second time. Yeah, Justin said, oh God, the frogs. <laughs> I'm sure that's covered well enough for now. Okay, so you can see that it's kind of gray. Uh, we're going to assume that that means it works. I'm going to put that here. Rinse it off really, really well. And then um, the thing about this solution, I should, that shouldn't have been contaminated. So I can put this back. Um, 
The reason this comes with a little beaker is because you want to use a very small amount of the liquid and if you think you've cross-contaminated it, especially with the more expensive gold, you just throw it out. You don't want to contaminate the rest of your bottle. I don't think I cross-contaminated anything, so I can uh, wash this out. Um, that yeah, if uh, uh, it should be clean on the bottom. Yeah, the nickel isn't quite so bad. Um, also, this nickel plating solution is really only, it's like $10, so it's... It's fine, it's not a big problem. Um, all right, again, uh, you wanna rinse things really well. Um, it's actually recommended to do a, a quick acid treatment. This is just Sparex or you know, Jeweler's Pickle. Uh, there are more commercial treatments that are recommended for plating, uh, but this will work. Thank you, Dave. If you, if you look at that, you can see it, it clearly looks very nickel plated in some spots. It looks a little less nickel plated in others. I could probably have gone a little bit longer for slightly better results, but that should work. Uh, now I'm gonna switch over. I've rinsed the pen. Uh, I'm switching over to a nub that I've already used for a bit of the gold solution. Again, it just goes in there. There's contacts inside that make the connection. Sorry, I, was, I was busy being non-observant. How did you um, clean the pen? Uh, just rinse it in distilled water. Okay. What they say. But you didn't exchange so the distilled water. So they say. Yeah. Hmm? You didn't exchange the distilled water between? Uh, yeah, that's why I have different. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's why I have different you. ones. Um, okay, so they also say that you should really get let these soak for a little bit before you go. I'm going to angle it. Because this, I really, you can see, I just, I really poured very little of this solution in there. Um, again, because, you know, if that was 80 bucks, this is... Ten? <laughs> and hopefully it, I won't feel like it's contaminated. Um, and again, it's like, it's like magic to me that it's clear. It's completely clear and then we'll start to see gold just appear on the object. So, um, the lead, get that at least a little bit clean. Put on again. Uh, Justin Mercier wants to know if you have a good electrochem etching unit, if you reverse the polarity leads, would that be strong enough for plating? I have no idea. <laughs> I do know that this, uh, this is sold uh, through jewelry supply catalogs and it was like $250 yeah. dollars and it has a nice pen handle, but I do know that you can, you can get something at Radio Shack that will act pretty similarly. Now, you need to look up a little electricity to make sure that it's comparable if you know more about electricity than I do. Um, but it's putting out, you know, one to, one to eight amps is what it's putting out. So um, I'm pretty sure you can, you can, I know you can because I used an old motorcycle battery. <laughs> you can make it work for a lot cheaper. Um, okay, so um, now I'm just going to do the same thing with the gold solution. Just let it sit there. You know what I'm actually going to do? Because I did this the other day and it actually worked quite nicely and I have a cup-shaped object. Uh, the rim on the pressed black should actually hold this in place a little. I can just do this. And get it everywhere. Nice. And hold it right in there and have a nice application of it going. Uh, it seemed to work better when I went higher last time. Um, okay, so I'm just going to leave it in one spot. And it takes a while and you start to think, oh crap, it's not going to do anything. And then it starts to do it. And if it doesn't, the whole demo's shot. Okay, <laughs> um, it's starting to go. It kind of, it seems like it takes a little bit to get going. And then once it does, it starts to become really obvious and work much better. We're starting to go now. Do you have any idea how thick a layer of gold we built up? Oh, it's like m m doing it this way, like what I did on those is millionths of an inch, and it's really, really, really thin. Okay, there's a camera getting some color there. It should start, should be starting to look a little less like, uh, that gray we had. 
get to a point where you start to feel like you can, you're painting with it as you start to see more actual gold get deposited. Do we have any questions while I'm sitting here doing this? Mm. Comments? Requests for more stories? Somebody says, I wonder if they use Andrew Baldilock Smith says, I wonder if they use pyrite in the solution. If they use what? Pyrites? Pyrite. Pyrites. Oh. oh, I don't, you know, I don't know. Uh, they tend to be like. Is there any pirates in there? Yeah, they tend to be like really, really weird salts. I think that okay. there is a lot of go on real good pirates. So yeah, possibly, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you took a pirate and put him in yeah. salt water, is a very yeah. good conductor. With all those he so, drew the short yeah. straws. Probably, put him in uh, <laughs> probably in the bilge, and That's especially uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're near uh, some area uh, of um, Central America, you could stop off and pick up a battery and mm -hmm. you could play it with a pirate. I'm yeah. pretty sure, and yeah. You just separate them. You get <laughs> a, a crew full of pirates and a pile of gold. And uh, Justin Mercy says, J. Arthur Ross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna put a little gold over here. A little happy gold. This, this, gold, this gold is saying, I'm a very wealthy king. Oh, he was making a joke about king. fool's gold. Fool's gold. Fool's gold. Oh, Joke. now don't I feel foolish? Oh, I feel foolish. Camera getting this? It's definitely starting to look gold now. <laughs> Nick wonders if we, you could just heat the object and rub the pirates on. Yeah, we That's probably could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. rub their gold teeth on it. <laughs> smash, smash, smash. Um, Do you have any yeah. idea if you were to make that piece in solid gold, how much? Well, you know, this stuff cost? is so thin, and if especially high carat gold is so soft that if it was a high carat gold, you could make this really thin out of press black. I think Pattern, this, do you know? this one weighs around three grams, or maybe four, so it would be a little more in gold and in copper, so I don't know what's the... What yeah, the, I mean, I think, I think... Five grams of gold, yeah. I think one of the... With the rim, the, 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 the brackets with the rim. Right? I think one of the nice things about press black is that it works well in very thin gold. Yeah. So, you know, it's probably one of the cost-saving <coughs> ways of showing off all of your gold. That's probably why they got used on helmets. Although some of those are gilded, too. So, thin. Yep. Okay. Oh, we're getting gold now, right? Is that coming up on camera? Are you guys getting good color? Yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, Sean Hollowood says, I have heard of pyrite being used as a plating before. I can't remember where, though. Huh. I don't know how that would work. Well, I mean like Indian pirates or like uh, Caribbean pirates. <laughs> Somalian. Like, yeah, Somalian, Somalian pirates. Somalian pirates, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he said pyrite. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know anything about that. I know nothing about I, that no, subject. I know nothing. <laughs> okay. So um, you can keep doing this for, the longer you do it, the thicker of a deposit you're going to get. Um, and since we should wrap it up, I think, getting close to now, I'm, I'm going to stop uh, with the plating portion of the show. However, I'm going to rinse it and dry it and maybe buff it up a little bit. I'll show you. It's not perfect, but... Uh, if I had kept at it for a little bit longer, it certainly could uh, be a lot more uh, gold colored and a little less irregular. Um, I see areas that look like they're a little darker. They're just not as plated yet. And then, like I said, the other thing that works pretty awesome is um, buffing, buffing it a little bit. Triona says, no parrot plating? I thought it always goes along with pirate plating. Yeah, it's true, it's true, but the parrot plating tends to look a lot more like enameling because of the bright plumage on the parrot. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Yes, if you get especially the, uh, the macaws with the, all of the colorful <laughs> feathers, it can look really, really fabulous. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, 
so here we have. Um, I could plate this further. I could buff it up a little more. It was also not polished to start with, so it has a bit of a rough aged look. But again, for color comparison, I mean, there's the copper and there's the gold. So this is a relatively safe way for modern artisans to get the effect of gold on something made out of all of those wonderful things that we can make stuff out of. Yes, or some such thing. Hello. Hi, it's been a long week. <laughs> <laughs> hey. oh, yeah.